Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. When I was seven years old, I traveled to Oregon with my family to visit relatives. We spent three weeks in the state, and I was lucky enough to see what I think was Bigfoot. We had camped in an area that was dense and close to a shallow river. It was almost like the camp was a bald spot, with a wall of brush and trees around it. There was a trail that led to the shallow river, and although it probably wasn't far, seemed so to me. The late afternoon was sunny and warm, and everyone but my cousin, my uncle, and myself went to look for herds of elk or antelope. We had campers to sleep in, and my uncle and my cousin were both napping when this sighting occurred. I was outside one of the campers, playing, when I heard a rustling of the underbrush. I never smelled anything that I can remember or heard a sound other than the rustling. When I looked up, I noticed that a small sapling, maybe the size of the end of a baseball bat, just bent completely over. The sapling was behind a thick wall of what appeared to be some sort of berry bush. But I'm not sure what kind, though. I was curious and walked over to where I'd seen the sapling bend over, thinking that there was a squirrel hanging on to it or something. That is when a large hand reached out from behind this bush and grabbed a handful of berries. It had to be eight or ten feet away from me at the time. The hand was huge, with long, reddish-brown hair. It was clear that it was a hand and not a paw. I stood there in total shock. When I managed to run, I ran for my life. It did not chase me or anything, but I saw all that I wanted to see of it. The hand was scary enough. I probably would have died of fright had I seen the rest of it. I got back into camp, which was not far away, but far enough for my napping cousin and uncle not to hear anything. I never screamed or made a sound. I just ran and sat as close to that camper as I could. I realized when I sat down in the fine dirt that I had wet my shorts. I was seven years old and had never done that before. I kept my mouth shut until my mother and my other uncles and aunts that were from Oregon got back from antelope and elk sightseeing. I told them everything, and they told me that it had to have been a bear. I described the color of the hair, that it must have been black hair that I had seen, because this area only had black bears. I wasn't stupid. I knew the difference between a hand and a paw, and the difference between reddish brown and black. I managed to let them convince me that it must have been a bear, and we left and came back to our home state of Mississippi. A few years later, I was in the sixth grade. We had a library period, and we could go look for and check out books. I found a book with a black cover, and if I'm not mistaken, the title was Bigfoot. I hurried to check this book out and read it from cover to cover. It wasn't until that moment that I figured out that the animal that I had seen those years earlier had a name. I had never been so excited in my life. Ever since, I have been interested in all sightings, shows, books of the Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yeti, Skunk Ape. I've thought about telling my story for years, but I, like everyone else, have been afraid of the teasing and skepticism of others. My family says we believe you believe what you saw. I will believe it until the day I die. I'm 29 now and I hope that the mystery will be solved in my lifetime. My husband and my son believe me more than my mom, dad, aunts, uncles, and cousins. I'm very genuine and honest, and I would never lie about something like that. I don't know why I was one of the chosen people to have had the opportunity to see even just a tiny part of this mysterious creature. I figured I'd just ask God when I get to heaven. 
I don't think anyone in my family ever believed me enough to go and check out the possibility of footprints or other evidence. Remember, at the time, I had no idea what I had seen. I don't know if they had a clue either. The name Bigfoot never came up. It was late afternoon, but still sunny and warm. At the time, the area was a heavily wooded mountain area with this little bald spot for a camping area. There was a shallow river near the camp. I know that Oregon and Washington and California have had many sightings. On to the next one. In Josephine County in Oregon, it was in Cave Junction, Oregon. My family was visiting my grandparents who lived there at the time. My family, my dad, mom, two sisters, and a brother were sleeping in a tent trailer. My sister and I slept on the side that overhangs the trailer hitch when, early one morning, the two of us were awoken to something scratching the bottom of our bed. Then it was scratching the tent part above us, then the three sides of our bed. Neither of us said a word, but moved quietly to the zipper where the window was. We slowly unzipped it, and were instantly assaulted with an awful smell. We saw dark brown fur up against this mesh, and the scratching was once again above us. We quietly got out of bed and woke my parents. But by the time we got them up and they went outside, it was gone. We figured that the movement of the trailer scared whatever it was off. We were positive it was Bigfoot. The trailer was parked on the pavement, so there was no way to know if there were footprints anywhere. My parents and grandparents never spoke of whatever they found or didn't find that day. It was in the early morning, just as the sun was coming up. It wasn't real bright out, but not dark. My grandparents lived in a house trailer. They had a paved driveway and a big garden in the backyard that led to the forest. We used to see many deer in the backyard, On to the next one. In Clackamas County in Oregon, my roommate and I were driving along Highway 224 between Carver and Barton at approximately 10 p.m. when I saw a pair of eyes reflecting in the darkness on the river side of the road. We frequently went to Estacada at night to visit a friend who was working at the Safari Club. We lived across from Rock Creek Sand and gravel at the time, and I had lived in the immediate area all my life. As we got closer to the reflection, I could see a creature standing near the road, behind some maple limbs. At first, when I saw the eyes, I thought it was an owl. When we went by it, I saw the creature from approximately chest to top of the head, with limbs obscuring the lower body. The color was very dark brown, its arms were at its sides. It just stood there, looking as we drove by. I didn't say anything for a mile or so, then asked my roommate if he had seen something along the highway. He answered yes, and I asked him what he saw. He told me the same thing as what I saw. We went back the next day in daylight to check it and see if it was possible that it could have been real. There were no clear tracks, but there was definitely a trail crossing the highway to the river from a swamp on top of the bluff. It would have been somewhere between Damascus and Boring. The limb that we saw the creature behind was about six and a half feet tall. Two or three years earlier, a friend of ours who lived on Grondlin Road was scared by a creature while he was walking home late at night. He saw it somewhere between Carver Bridge and Baker's Cabin. Anyway, he said it scared the heck out of him and he ran the rest of the way home. I never used to believe in the hairy people before I saw it myself. I would like to see one again. What caught both our attention were the eye reflections, as we are both hunters and outdoor woods people. The other witness was the passenger in my vehicle. The night was clear, dry, dark and warm in the 60s, around 10 to 11 p.m., late summer. Leaves hadn't turned yet. Heading toward Estacada and Clackamas River is on the right. 
the swamp or marsh area on the left diagonally, if I remember correctly, and a cliff or bluff behind swamp. On to the next one. I am originally from Oregon, and I was back there a few years ago when I had an experience that was so frightening that I told only a very few people. This happened back in 2009, and I always wished more people could know about it. I live now in Borger, Texas, by Amarillo, and our Lake Meredith is almost a twin to Oregon's Lake Billy Chinook, over near Madras. Your Metolius River runs through that lake, like the Canadian River flows through Texas's Lake Meredith. To continue, back in 2009, my wife and I were up visiting family in Oregon. Uncle Ed and I had spent time camping and fishing at Lake Meredith a couple of years back when he came to Texas, and he made a comment about how the two lakes were so much alike they could be twins. So then and there, we got things together, and the two of us packed our supplies and Eddie's aluminum boat, and three days later, we were camped in Cove Palisade State Park in Oregon. The country was beautiful, and they were having a hot spell, but at least it was the dry heat of the desert country that I prefer. The ranger came by our camp and apologized, but said he was posting the lake against fishing for two days due to some fingerlings they were dumping into the lake from Warm Springs Indian Reservation side, and they wanted to make sure they dispersed properly before allowing us to disturb the waters. We were in no hurry, and we pretty much had the campground to ourselves, as it seemed like everybody else must have known about this fish stocking but us. There was one other pickup with a large camper on the back, and the people had two young but huge dogs. They were some sort of bull mastiffs or whatever, but as we were walking near their campsite, they were straining at their chains, making the god-awfulest growling and slobbering I'd ever seen. The owners seemed like nice folk, and they came away from their camp to say hello. They explained that they were breeders, and this outing was to socialize the dogs before their new owners, came to pick them up, as they needed to get used to people. Judging from the ferocity of those monsters, we figured it would take a lot more socializing. Only not with us. Our first full day was spent by hiking along the northern corner of the lake, and around the corner, across the Metolius River, was all the Indian reservation. We saw the other campers hiking up by the large bend where the river ended, the lake and those large dogs looked almost like bears the way they lumbered through the meadow. Across the river was Mount Jefferson and Three-Fingered Jack, and I hadn't seen these majestic mountains for so many years that I was standing there and taking in all of the beauty when, suddenly, I heard loud, fierce barking and saw the explosive charge of those monstrous dogs as they charged through a distant field. Their owners were standing there, blowing frantically on their shrill whistles, and the dogs were running all out with their leashes trailing in midair, and they quickly disappeared into a patch of dense pine trees surrounded by berry bushes. We could only stand there and listen to the loud barking, and then there were deeper sounds, like snarling, and then a horrible scream like something had been hurt really bad. And after that, not a sound except the wind. Eddie and I were up further on the hillside when two figures burst from the trees heading back up the ridge. But they weren't the dogs. They were large, ape-like animals, but they ran on two legs. And if it hadn't been for the coats of long hair stranding out in the wind, Neither of us would have paid them any mind, but we could see they weren't human. Then, down the slope, we saw the two dogs running downhill, and they were both limping, one especially bad and barely able to drag his back legs. The other one had only a slight limp, but even from our distance away, we could see 
that it was bleeding at the shoulder and neck. Meanwhile, we had both swung our gazes back to the boogeymen, and now, in just a matter of a minute, they had gained the thick forest that enveloped the rest of the mountainous canyon ridge. Then all was quiet, but for the faint whining and the occasional yip from the poor dog. We went over to see if we could help the people, and by the time we got there, they had managed to pressure stop the ones bleeding and put medication from their backpack's first aid kit on the wounds, enough to evidently ease the poor animal's pain somewhat. There didn't seem to be any broken bones, but the more severe cuts and places where the fur had been torn or sliced off were obviously painful, and both dogs kept licking at their semi-bandaged wounds. We accompanied the folks back to their camp, which took an hour or more due to allowing for the slowly limping dogs. They were far too large and heavy to carry. Discussing what had happened as we returned to camp, we discovered that these people had not seen the animals that the game warden later identified by our description as Sasquatch. There had evidently been pine trees between themselves and the dogs, enough so as to completely block their view. When Eddie and I told them what we had witnessed, they were absolutely astounded. They asked us several times to repeat our descriptions of the Bigfoot animals because they said they had many friends who claimed to have had sightings and encounters with these animals. But here they were, having their dogs in a fight with them and missing the whole thing. You know, there's only one thing that was even less understandable and totally disappointing. The unimaginable and ridiculous fact that this whole time I had a camera in my fatigue vest front pocket and I didn't even think about it until I took my vest off back at camp. When I mentioned it to Ed, he said my secret was safe with him and he hadn't thought about it either. By the time the dogs and their people left, the dogs seemed to be okay, but they certainly acted very docile and tame. I guess you could say they were now socialized. On to the next one. The summer I was 11, my great aunt owned a small four-room cabin in a remote part of Canada. The nearest town or neighbor was almost 10 miles away. Back in that day, we still used the old-fashioned ice box with a block of ice, a hand pump that brought water up from the lake where the cabin was built. We also had no electricity and, of course, no toilet, but we had the outhouse. It was early morning and I was the first one up and had to go use the bathroom. So, I went outside and walked to the outhouse. After I'd finished, I started to look around since we had arrived at the cabin when it was dark the night before. I wanted to explore, but I didn't get very far. I had rounded the outhouse and was thinking about entering the woods. It was only a couple of minutes before I noticed movement about 30 yards from me. I froze and watched a huge, hairy creature walking on two legs, moving through the trees away from me. It wasn't making any sounds that I could hear. I just watched until it became obscured by the growth of trees and shrubbery. Then I hightailed it back to the cabin. I woke my brother up to tell him, but he didn't believe me. Neither did my aunt. But she told me she's heard strange howls and screams in the years before, blaming them on bobcats, my grandmother, who'd gone up there a couple of times as well, also said that she'd heard the screams, said it terrified her, and she'd never went back. I spent the rest of our vacation playing only at the lake, looking over my shoulder and avoiding the woods altogether. Since then, I've been obsessed with cryptids and learning whatever I can, trying to weed through the fakes and hoaxes, trying to get another look at the being from my childhood. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell 
and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!